I, I did a big presentation to a group of scientists. Uh, it was about maybe 70 scientists. It was the top leaders of Australia's top, you know, sort of government science organisation. And, you know, it was a sort of like a two-hour workshop I think I was running. And at the end, uh, one of the... They call the, the heads of each of the divisions, they call them chiefs, you know. So the, one of the chiefs came up to me at the end, a little little guy, an American actually, he, um, came up to me and he grabbed me by the arm and he sort of pulls me in close and he says, uh, I resent what you're doing. And I said, <laughs> oh, Jesus, what, what's going on here? And then he pulls me in a bit close and he says, because you're giving away my secrets. From cave drawings to family histories to stories around the fire, humans crave order among chaos, connection amid isolation. So we tell stories. Our mission at the Storytellers Network is to bring the art of story to the masses. Whether you're in marketing, you're an entrepreneur, or you're developing your own personal brand, telling your story effectively can make the difference between celebrating milestones and collecting unemployment. The Storytellers Network strives to help storytellers tell their stories so you can learn from the best. Now, your host, the inbound evangelist himself, Dan Moyle. Welcome to the Storytellers Network podcast. I am Dan Moyle, your host, and I'm so glad you're listening in today. Uh, in this episode, we get to hear from a sought after keynote speaker, international business consultant, and executive coach who works with global organizations like Mars, uh, Alliance, SAP, Shell, and all kinds of others. He's the founder of Anecdote, the world's largest business storytelling company, where they actually help leaders and sellers around the world find and tell oral stories with impact. And it's very cool to hear from this guy. Uh, he's also the award-winning author of Putting Stories to Work, Mastering Business Storytelling, a great book. Uh, an interesting trivia, he holds a bachelor's degree in geography and archaeology from the Australian National University, but he's a storyteller. Uh, for sales and leaders and, and uh, sellers and leaders and stuff. So very cool. Uh, and today, Sean Callahan shares with the Storytellers Network, his storytelling craft, successes and failures, in other words, his story. And as we get into that conversation, just a reminder uh, to visit the storytellersnetwork.com for past episodes, for resources to help you tell your story better, and just to poke around a little bit, maybe even uh, get in touch with me if you need to. So there you go. Without further ado, let's get to those stories. Well, there, ladies and gentlemen, Sean Callahan uh, joining the Storytellers Network. Thanks for the for the, the time today, my friend. Uh, welcome to the show. Thanks, Dan. It's great to be here. Absolutely. So, one of the things that I've loved exploring over the last fifty some episodes is is the idea that storytellers can be from anywhere, can do this what we do, the storytelling craft from anywhere. So, let's start with that. Where are you geographically in the world, sir? Right. Well, starting with the, the background here, you can sort of see I'm in my office, yeah. <laughs> home office actually. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it's early. In, it's early in the morning. So uh, the home office is the starting point. But I'm in Melbourne, Melbourne, Australia. Right. And however, Dan, I was actually born in the U.S. Were you really? Yeah. Yeah. I was born in South Carolina. So my my father was a U.S. Marine and uh, was posted in South Carolina, and then eventually through embassy postings ended up in Australia. So that's oh. uh, how we got here. So you don't really have a South Carolina sound to you. You have that Australia sound no. to you. <laughs> well, you know what happens, you know, when oh, I was five years old when I arrived to Australia hmm. and kids tend to beat accents out of you. Right? <laughs> I probably shouldn't laugh at that, but. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, it's, it's not as dramatic as it sounds, but uh, you know, you certainly are, are um, pulled, you know, the, the accent is pulled apart a little bit and uh, and focused on way too much for a young kid. So you quickly get into the accent of everyone around you, right? And have you been uh, there in Australia since you were five then or do you come back to the U.S. at all? Or Oh, I'm, I'm in the U.S., uh, you know, every year and yeah, mainly for work. Um, so, in fact, I'm heading over to Silicon Valley for some work uh, in December. So I'm, I'm heading back. The funny thing is, when I when I come back to a, to the US, I often will leave on my Australian passport and enter on my American. And of course, the accent is a bit off-putting for the customs people. And they ask me lots of questions. They want to know, you know, what the story is. And more often than not, at the end of the interview, they look at me very earnestly and they just say, "Well, welcome home, son." <laughs> 
and, and you're just doing it to mess with them probably, right? No. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> no, I'm just doing it for the shorter lines. That's what I'm doing it for. Yeah, right? <laughs> So, so you're, so you were, you founded Anecdote. You sound like a storyteller. You've written a book. You do this on social media. Um, and, and I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that stereotypically uh, Marines tell each other stories, but was your dad much of a storyteller? I mean, what does he think about this? Is he still with us? I guess. Yeah. Yeah. He's okay. still with us. Uh, he's just about to turn 80. Uh, he, he's definitely a storyteller, right? He's, he's you know, it's, it, and the stories he used to tell, especially when we were younger, uh, well, you know, some of his amazing exploits as a, as a U.S. Marine, he doesn't seem to tell that many these days, but back in the day he did. And you'd be at the edge of your seat, you know. I mean, some of it was as much as reenacting the assassination of JFK, right? Stuff like that, right? So, you know, throwing a whole bunch of conspiracy theory type stuff in it as well. It's, uh, it's quite a good story. So, yeah, definitely a storyteller. I didn't, I, of course, you ne- never realise this when you're growing up. You know, and you don't actually see it until you're able to step out of it and sort of look back and go, oh, actually, that person there does tell stories. So, yeah, that's how we got started, I guess. And do you think, so do you think that's where you learned it from? Or does that just kind of a natural thing that we do in our families and then you put it to use later? Well, I'm always interested in how people become storytellers. Some, Some people... Yeah. It just seemed to be very natural with doing it. And and I do think a lot of that's got to do with the, either the family culture or maybe the national culture. Mm-hmm. Like, for example, when I go to India, I find that just about every uh, Indian there uh, is telling stories. And it's like you will, you'll jump into a cab and the first thing they'll do is, you know, in the conversation, the next thing you know, they're telling a story. Usually it's to do with some... Uh, Indian god, you know, Shiva and some sort of exploit of Shiva and what they did here and there. And then they would link it into some principle that they're trying to convey to you. So I think it's just how close stories are to the surface, right, Dan? It's sort of like, if it's very close to the surface, those people pick them up. But then in other places, you just don't hear anyone tell stories at all. It's uh, quite remarkable. So, yeah. So you think, so it's kind of cultural for us then, yeah? I mean, that's... Yeah, I mean, we all, we're all telling stories. I mean, it's yeah. not, we can't avoid that, right? But it's just how close to the surface the stories are that in terms of just how easy we are at okay, telling stories. I mean, for me, it became explicit working for IBM because at IBM, I, I happened to bump into this uh, guy called Dave Snowden who was, uh, he's a genius level sort of fellow, right? And he was fascinated by uh, stories and storytelling but he was interested in how you collect stories in organisations. So how do you go in, like an anthropologist, you know, go into, into a business and find out what the culture is based on the stories that you can find. And, and so I ended up working in his group and as a, as a team, we started to then go, you know, here is specific, this is a story, that's not a story, right? And then you become very um, mindful of the stories that are popping up and, whether you're in story mode or not. And, yeah. and I think in, in the training that we do, we, we're trying to help people actually get that skill as the first skill is to be able to spot stories. So, yeah, so I think that's where it became explicit. And, and in, in my research, I saw that one of the things that you've said, um, the most successful leaders are storytellers. And so that's kind of comes into what you just said, then we're effective when we're storytellers. Why do you think that is? What is it that make storytelling so powerful for leaders especially? Well, I think um, there's a couple of things. One is that the, they create empathy, you know, between them and their colleagues, mm. right, just by sharing their story. One of the things we're really interested in about our leaders is we want to know what sort of character they have. You know, we're not so much interested in their credentials. We want to know their character. And their character is reflected in the things that they do. And, yeah, we get to see that, and that's great. But there's a lot of things we don't get to see, right, but are conveyed through stories. So, you know, the stories that are told, that's why we tell so many leaders' stories in organisations because we're trying to work out, uh, you know, what what will our leader do? Which way will they jump when things get difficult, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Uh, But I think the other thing that, um, you know, leaders are very good at doing when they're sharing stories is they're conveying the principles and the values that are important to the business or they're giving lessons learned, you know, don't do this and then they'll share an example and, you know, it becomes concrete and there's that emotion there because 
the end of the day, we actually make decisions based on emotion as much as we do on, you know, sort of clever reasoning or anything like that. So I think well, there's some of the reasons. Yeah. Well, and so often it seems like we make decisions, whether it's buying or others based on emotion and then <clears throat> justify it with logic. If we even get to that point of, of oh, yeah, justifying yeah. it, right? So Bob, yeah, Bob. That's right. I remember buying a house, this one here, and we had all this criteria, you know, for uh, buy had to be North facing, you know, to get the sun <laughs> and you know, all those sort of things. And yeah. of course it's a West facing house, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't, it doesn't meet any of those criteria, but you walk in, you fall in love with it. You know, the decision, you know, turns on a dime, right? Absolutely. Uh, and something you said, I, I want to get back to something you just said too, Sean. Uh, we look to stories when things get difficult in order to kind of predict what comes next, maybe, or frame where we are. I mean, I mean, yeah. that's a pretty powerful thing too, is that when, when stories can be that for us to frame the world around us, do you see that a lot in business then too, obviously? Oh, that's right. And there's a, there was a clever experiment done uh, to illustrate this. They put um, essentially people into MRI scanners and one person would tell a story and the other person would listen to the story. And what they discovered was only when they're in story mode did their brains actually sync up, you know, that the areas that were, um, you know, active were exactly the same as the areas who were for the person listening. But the really spooky thing about it is that every now and then the, the listener's brain, the patterns were ahead of the, of the teller, right? Interesting. And that what they were doing was that they were actually predicting what's next, right? And you can only do that with a story. Like if, you know, you have... Now, a good story actually is one where the listener is going, I wonder what happens next. I wonder what happens next, right? And, uh, and that's essentially what we're doing. And, and they s discovered that the people who were doing that predictive element, their comprehension of the story actually jumped up because you really have to know the story to be able to predict the next thing. It's like watching a murder mystery, right? You've got to get all the, you know, the connections to sort of make the, you know, your prediction as to who did it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that becomes a really important element in organisations, especially when there's lots of change going on, right? So if there's lots of turmoil in your organisation, you're trying to work out where you sit, you know, the sort of work that you do um, and what's going to happen next because, you know, where, what do you need to do to keep yourself safe, if you like, right? And that's what stories do for us. Absolutely. Yeah. And and when you, when you know that and you're, and you're in leadership and, and you know that you're, uh, you know, engaging and charming and everything, you can, you can really get people to follow you. And when it's positive, that's a great thing. But when that turns negative, how do we as, you know, other storytellers or as listeners, how yeah. can we differentiate that? And I mean, that's a, that's a very powerful thing. You mean when the, some of the stories turn negative, uh, you know, the power of that negativity or? Yeah, I mean, I think you can use that power for good or evil, right? I mean, and that's, <laughs> and that's hard sometimes. Uh, and yeah. so, I mean, how do you, how do you differentiate? If we make, if we make decisions based on emotion and somebody, somebody is a very charismatic storyteller. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. You know, yeah. How, how do we, what, what's the kryptonite, I guess? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, I think you have to be, um, I, you have to be mindful of what's going on around you, right? If you just allow stories to impact you without you sort of saying to yourself, okay, yeah, that's, uh, someone said to me once that, um, you know, the plural of anecdote is not data, right? Yeah, that's good. And, and so, you know, you have to, when you do hear an anecdote, you know, if you're on the receiving end, you do have to be mindful. Okay, so where did that come from? Um, you know, does it, does it have any support in the research? Am I hearing other stories? Now, the reality is we are um, overly influenced, if you like, from a story than we are from just about anything else. And in fact, the best stories are the ones that fold the data and the research into it. I love sharing stories of, um, you know, of peer reviewed research, right? So, cause you get the peer reviewed, you know, article plus the, uh, the story plus the, the point that you're trying to make. Um, it's great when you're dealing with, you know, very technical people, engineers and scientists and, you know, financial wonks, for example. Um, but yeah, I think you do, you just have to be, have that, that mindfulness. That, and it comes back to the fact that you know when a story's being told or not, right? Mm -hmm. Once you know that, you can sort of be 
skeptical, I suppose, is the mindset you have to adopt, you know, in that sort of world. Yeah. Um, Great. Great. But, you know, but, you know, the, you know, leaders, the leaders who really understand it are, um, um, you know, do wield, wield that power in, and like you say, have to wield it for good rather than evil. I, I did a big presentation to a group of scientists. Uh, it was about maybe 70 scientists. It was the top leaders of Australia's top, you know, sort of government science organisation. And, you know, it was a sort of like a two hour workshop, I think I was running. And at the end, uh, one of the, they call the, the heads of each of the divisions, they call them chiefs. You know, so the, one of the chiefs came up to me at the end, a little little guy, an American actually, he, um, came up to me and he grabbed me by the arm and he sort of pulls me in close and he says, uh, I resent what you're doing. And I said, <laughs> oh, Jesus, what's going on here? And then he pulls me in a bit closer and he says, because you're giving away my secrets. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, like these these guys who know how to know what it is and know what the power is you know they it's a, it's just almost like a, a steve denny once wrote a book called the secret language of leadership right and and the more i think about that i think this is what's happening is that leaders who discover it they don't like to tell anyone else that they know it right <laughs> because when you're sharing a story no one really knows you're sharing a story unless you make the you know the 101 rookie error of saying um, Hey, I want to tell you a story, right? Yeah. Um, if you're not doing that, you know, the audience doesn't really know. They just they just absorb it. That's just information for them, presented in a way that's uncannily interesting and, and engaging, right? So that's uh, I think that's what you know good leaders are, are working with. Yeah. And when you're giving these presentations, you, you rattled off a couple of what I would consider maybe dry industries. Um, are you teaching them how to use story? Is that why you're giving those presentations? Yeah. Yeah. That's what we do. It's uh, we're either helping leaders or, uh, or sellers. They're our two yeah. main sort of uh, target areas, I guess. Yeah. And, you know, I think, you know, when we started you know, 14 years ago, um, people were, thought we were crazy, you know, we were, you know, these, they, so I think they saw us as these tree hugging lefties or something like that. <laughs> who were into storytelling or whatever. And they quite, they couldn't quite get their head around it, but now it's, it's a totally different world. I mean, you know, I was in Seattle not long ago, uh, running a program for Seattle, uh, Seattle for, for Microsoft and, uh, and it was all their technical salespeople. So these are real techo guys, right? Mainly guys, uh, a few women there as well. And, you know, they, they, they knew on one hand that it was important, but they don't know how to do it, right? Even though they know how to do it naturally, right? Like if, when they go down to a cafe, that's what they do with each other. They share stories back and forth. But, they, but we've learned somehow in organisations to talk in a very um, abstract way. We sort of say things like, so there are three things I want to talk about here. And as a result of that, and therefore, and... You know, so if we look at, you know, the collaboration and the articulation and the integrity of the integration and, you know, we, we use all this sort of high level language, which unfortunately is totally meaningless to most listeners, right? Jargon. So once you, once you get them, the big learning for me in recent years is there are some very basic things that people need to know how to do and knowing how to do it in the sense of um, Dan could you tell me what you need to do and you can reply that's not enough right because this is a this is a practice based thing right and i i it's like i think um bob sutton used to call it the knowing doing gap right so people know it but they can't do it and and to get them to the point where people can do it you just have to have lots and lots of practice right and you have to be willing to make mistakes and look stupid and feel uncomfortable and then once you get into it, it becomes an, a habit right it becomes something you normally just do as a way of chatting to people and on that road to being a better storyteller you are going to sometimes look like an idiot and that's okay and make mistakes <laughs> yeah, <that's it>. right <laughs> if you don't suck it, at that, first you're not doing something that, right <laughs> that's it exactly that's exactly right. um so so really i mean being a storyteller doesn't have to be in some kind of you know 
super interesting. I guess, I mean, everything's interesting to the right people, but it doesn't have to be in some kind of like super popular industry. You can do this, like I said, for kind of the drier industry. So if you're a storyteller, what I'm hearing you say, Sean, is that is it, have hope that you can, you can go find how to tell, you can go find storytelling jobs in any kind of company. Or if you're in that company, you can be a storyteller. Yeah, yeah. Look, I don't think there's that many storytelling jobs mm -hmm. out there. Like, they're, they're not, there's certainly very few organizations that are actually calling it, except for the consulting companies that sort of say they have a chief storyteller or whatever like that. But, you know, the big corporations I'm working with, um, you know, they'll have people who are uh, involved in, in internal communications or HR or organizational development or, you know, all those types of roles. And in that, having a story capability is actually super important, right? I've just, I've just um, finished a project with a bank, right? Where the bank, we ended up training 1,700 bank managers, right? So you would think as a dry, you know, sort of job that could be one of the driest, right? Yeah. But here's the thing, this is the problem they're facing. Um, they had realized, and I think Wells Fargo is going through this as well in the US, but they had realized here in Australia that their financial incentives that they had their frontline staff, you know, sort of using was driving the wrong behavior, right? So essentially a customer would walk in the door and they were just thinking, I'm going to sell them a mortgage because that's, we need to sell 10 mortgages, right? Mm -hmm. And they weren't really thinking about what the customer's needs were. Anyway, they've made a, a decision to get rid of all financial incentives. So the question is, mm. how do you motivate um, frontline employees when they don't have any financial incentives? We've got to use implicit incentives and connect to purpose and stories do that. So we were teaching them how to find and tell customer impact stories. And it's really interesting just how the shift that's made in that bank, you know, and just the conversation and how they see things and the attitude and the mindset is just phenomenal. Um, so yeah, it can be in a very dry area, uh, but you know, it's, it's a skill that anyone can learn. No doubt about it. Yeah. And, and while it may not be necessarily like, like chief storytellers or storyteller specialists or whatever, yeah, I'd like to think that storytellers who, those of us who consider ourselves storytellers, can look outside of that regular, like, oh, I, I bet I should be an author then or something. And we can go find these, these jobs that have storytelling aspects because that's becoming more and more prevalent, I guess. Yes. Right? And that's kind of a hopeful thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's a hopeful thing. I mean, I'm, I sort of rail against a little bit the, the folk who, have, who are coming out of the screenwriting author sort of world uh, as a way of trying to inform businesses in their storytelling practice because I don't think the two match up. Mm. So I call the difference between big S storytelling, which is what screenwriters and, you know, uh, authors do. But when you go and collect stories in organisations, you find that they're little stories. They're tiny little stories. Mm. Um, you know, that's why we call the company Anecdote. It's really these tiny things you're dealing with. And so the type of storytelling you do in organisations is different to what you do when you're crafting the next, you know, blockbuster in, in Hollywood. And, you know, and so things like the hero's journey and, you know, those types of techniques are very good for big storytelling but not great for small storytelling. Hmm. And that's, that's our differentiator. When we go into organisations, we say that and the business people just go, oh, thank God. <laughs> you know, because they thought they had to do all this fancy, you know, X number of steps and then there's the threshold and then there's the, you know, sort of, um, you know, sort of the return of the, the monster and, uh, and all the whatever bits they might have in that sort of uh, way of thinking. We go, no, no, it's much simpler than that. What's your point? Tell the story. You know, it's, it's a, a simpler process. Yeah. So that's pretty interesting to me because I, I hear that a lot and, and, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm never one to necessarily be combative. So when people say that, I don't necessarily combat it, but I've always kind of wondered like, does every business really have to be the Luke Skywalker to, 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 to the Yoda to, for the customer and blah, blah, blah. So that's, I, I, that's very interesting to me that you say, no, don't do that. You don't yeah. need to do that. So that's cool. No. And the other thing too, is that um, it, it just sort of sends people down the wrong path. I think, especially when you're, 
trying to do things like, at the moment, I'm actually uh, working with some luxury brands uh, to help their front frontline retailers uh, have conversations with uh, their prospects when they walk in their door. And they're really tiny stories, right? They're stories like, um, you know, they might have, tell a story about other customers. They say, oh, we had a, a person in just um, two days ago and they were looking at this thing and then they did this and they actually took it back and, you know, like they tell a little story about how another customer has used it and you go, yeah, I want to use it like that as, as well. And it's, So we're not talking big stories here. We're not talking about amazing things that are going to blow people away, but these are important for people to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Most definitely. So it's, it's communication, it's empathy, it's conversation. It's not epic stories. It's just talking story, right? Yeah. That's how, that's that's right. in Australia, or that's how I say it in uh, Hawaii, right? <laughs> yeah. I don't know, but it's, uh, it sounds pretty good to me. I like that idea. Yeah. Talking stories. Yeah. Talk, talking story. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so now this, in this season in particular, I've, I, I've connected with a lot of people who use social media for storytelling. Um, right. Now I've seen you, you know, you, you've, you've uh, been on Twitter for a while. You've got quite a nice little following going on there. How do you use social media? Or, well, let me ask you this. Is social media storytelling different than other kinds of storytelling in your mind? Well, I would, so I'm, I'm, I do notice a big difference between oral storytelling and written storytelling. So that's the big, the one, and my main interest is oral storytelling. Hmm. So in social media, when it's told on a video or in audio, podcasts, etc., cetera, um, that's that, in that oral form. Um, and, and so I find it really interesting that, uh, you know, people are, have got this mindset around videos and, and audio clips, you know, and people don't have a big, um, you know, sort of attention span. We need to make them shorter and snappier and, you know, really get to the point really quickly. Yet, you know, Tim Ferriss does a, a, an hour and a half podcast, right? And one of the reasons he can do an hour and a half podcast is because he's actually very good at getting his listeners to tell stories, right? Mm -hmm. He asks story eliciting questions. And, and so, you know, I suppose this is the bigger element of, of social media. It's, you know, just how to create interesting content. And, um, you know, if you can share a story that, um, you know, engages people in, in a, relevant context you know that's that's way more interesting um yeah i don't know i think i, I haven't done that much on you know the social media front I, I mean we're just using mainly linkedin twitter and facebook i suppose are the three main sort of areas and and youtube as well but not so well there mm -hmm. um and you know what we're doing and you know is is trying to, at every point especially with our blog our blog, we're always trying to tell a story, you know, have a few anecdotes. And in fact, we've got this little story finder so you can actually find all the stories that have ever been told in our, in our blog posts around, you know, various topics, um, just as another source of uh, stories to, to tell. Yeah, so look, I don't have any good big insights, I don't think, around <laughs> social, social media. I think that's what I'm learning. As I'm talking here, Dan, I'm thinking I don't really know too much about it. That's all right. No, I think, I think that's kind of the key to social is that, you know, it, the, from what I've learned over a, a dozen interviews in the social media um, season is that yeah. most of us use social media to tell micro anecdotes maybe. Right. Um, yes. And then promote our bigger anecdotes or bigger stories. So it's less about social media storytelling and more about just sharing the stories through social media, I guess. And that's yeah, kind of what yeah, I hear yeah. you saying, Sean. So. Yeah, well, I think as long as you're actually telling a story, right? I mean, often we, we hear people say, oh, look, we're, we're sharing a story. But then when you look at it, there's no story elements in it. It's them just giving their opinion about something. Mm -hmm. So it only, you only get the benefits of storytelling if you're actually telling a story, right? And, you know, so that's, you know, it has to have events happening. There has to be, um, you know, it's obvious it, more often than not starting, it starts with a time marker when someone says, Oh yeah, a couple of days ago I was, you know, dot, 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 you know, that's, that's the beginning of a story. I do, I do push back against, you know, people saying, Oh, you need to have a protagonist who faces a challenge, who overcomes a challenge because that's hero's journey thinking. Right. And I can tell you stories that don't have any of those things. And, you know, the, probably the biggest example 
uh, This American Life did a whole uh, episode on it, is coincidence stories, right? Now, in a coincidence story, we love a coincidence story. We love to hear how things come together in an unexpected way and no one expected it, you know, really just like that. There's no hero. There's no challenge. You know, there's no any of those sort of things. It's just, oh, you know, this happened and then, you know, we, we bumped into Bob. We hadn't seen Bob for 20 years. Oh, my God, that was amazing. You know, <laughs> but for some reason we love those sort of stories, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I think we can see ourselves in it. We all have a coincidence in our lives or whatever, so. Yeah, um, exactly. Now, uh, you, you said you, you like the, the oral side of storytelling. Mm. Um, we, we, I, I see a lot out there in the world, and I hear about conversational writing. Is that, so, so I, I think of social media as al- almost like an oral storytelling, even though it is written. Is, yes. is, is, that, is that a thing, do you think? Like that conversational writing through like a tweet. If I read a tweet yeah. out loud, does that make it oral storytelling or is it still written storytelling? Well, there's a couple of things that happen in, uh, the short answer is I think it gets closer and closer to that conversational writing, okay. with, getting close to the oral storytelling because there's some things you can do in oral uh, communication that you typically don't do in written. So for example, cliches in written are a no-no, right? Cliches in oral are a good thing. Right, because oral storytelling, uh, using a cliche, just helps us connect to something very familiar with it, and you know it's a sort of a connection point. We do other things in oral. We repeat ourselves in oral uh, storytelling, which you don't get away with in written. Um, you can have you can have un- uncompleted you know sentences in the oral telling, which you can't have in in written. So there's there's a whole range. And the other thing too, of course, in oral is you actually have a real life back and forths more often than not okay and and that gives there's a lovely um a scene in um the wire i don't know if you ever saw that show Mm -hmm. fantastic storytelling in there right yeah and like six guys sitting in a bar um and one's one sort of starts off saying bob bob go and tell him tell him about it and bob starts to tell the story right and as he's telling the story uh each person jumps in and adds their own story you know, owns their own element of that story, right? And to me, that's the, you know, the real essence of oral storytelling when it's done in a group. It's not just the one storyteller standing up there, you know, forthright and sending out the story. It's yeah. this real communal sort of activity that's going on and that, that creates connection. And you asked right at the beginning of the interview, you know, about leaders who are able, you know, why do they share stories? If you can get that dynamic happening, you know, that's a, a level of connection you don't get uh, when you're using any other sort of uh, way of communicating. Yeah. Yeah. Communal. That's a good way. That's a, that's a great way to take in stories too. I mean, I love being a part of that sitting around the yeah. campfire, sitting at a bar, whatever it is. So. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Uh, so, so you, so Sean, you, you travel the world, you have this company, you, you wrote a book, uh, you're interviewed on podcasts. Um, how did you get as a storyteller from, your, your days at uh, Australia University, National University, uh, as, a, as a geography and archaeology guy, to having your own company, telling stories from, from a stage and teaching others. How did that journey kind of happen for you? Well, I mean, there's lots of different ways of telling that, of course. But, you know, <laughs> there's, there's, there's a couple of events that really were important. And the first event was not this company, but a previous company in my 20s. I started a company with my, my dear friend, Peter Fox. Um, and it was a company to write guidebooks for national parks, right? So both Pete and I thought it would be great to um, get paid by going bushwalking. You know, it's not a bad thing to do when you're in your 20s. Sure. And we built, we built this up to quite a little, you know, sort of a, a thriving business. There was about 15 of us working there and we're doing all this uh, work around Australia, etc., and then we went broke. Right, we went, we just absolutely nosedived. We ran out of money, and we had to fire everyone. Mm-hmm. And in, luckily, we were all in our twenties. We sort of threw a party, you know, had some beers, and everyone high fived each other, and that was the end of the business, sort of thing. And but you can do that when you're twenty, right? When you're forty, which is when I started Anecdotes, uh, it's a different sort of environment. And I, I really got into it because I was working at IBM 
doing these projects of collecting stories and big culture change projects and jumped out uh, to start Anecdote. And we did sort of similar work, right, to start with, as you do, right? But our customers quickly asked us, uh, oh, you know, you guys seem to know a lot about stories. Can you help us to be better storytellers? And we said, no, we're not doing that. Too dangerous, too open to manipulation. Um, you know, real ethical issues, we thought, there. And they, they were very persistent. They kept on asking and pushing us. And so we sort of said to them, okay, we will help you with some of your stories, but we are not going to craft stories for you. We're not going to make up stories. You've got to go and find them in your organisation and we will teach you how to tell them. Um, and we'll give you that sort of approach to creating storytelling as a habit to what, how you communicate. And so that was the beginning of our story business, but we would always have this really strong background of what we call story listening. And in fact, I'm in uh, Silicon Valley uh, teaching a program on story listening. Um, we got this program called um, Story Powered Culture Change. You know, and how do you go and collect stories in an organisation, work out the patterns of behaviour and then design interventions which are based on sort of complexity ideas. Um, so story listening is a really important part of story work. So you've got story listening, storytelling, but the third element, we call it story triggering. And that's, that's when a leader does something so remarkable that people will actually share stories about it. Mm. It's kind of like, um, you know, sort of a ritual or a, um, you know, sort of, uh, you know, some sort of effort, a remarkable uh, activity that they do that people go, wow. And then you know, the, the stories then flow, if you like. Yeah. But that's, that's really how I got into it. And, and, and then, you know, it, we started off as a little business, uh, you know, in Melbourne. And the breakthrough for us that sort of turned us into a, a bigger organisation is that we decided to uh, productize our programs and license them to other companies, mm. right? So we have, we now deliver our programs in 20 odd countries, in 11 languages, and it's all through a large network of licensees who, um, you know, who deliver our programs. Interesting. Uh, so that's, that's how we sort of grew our business. You know, it probably wouldn't have happened unless we'd done it that way. Yeah. Very cool. What's yeah. um, what what piece of shining genius advice would you give to uh, an aspiring storyteller out there just trying to take that next step after after talking to all these storytellers, being one yourself? Like, yeah. what, what what sage advice would you give to somebody? Well, I think the one of the, one one thing I would say is the stories are not about words; they're about pictures, right? So you know, when I shared that story about the scientist who grabbed my arm and pulled me close, right? Um, you could probably picture that happening in your own mind's eye. So stories are all about trying to create those pictures. And you do that by bringing the story right down to a moment, right? just one small moment. Uh, and that's where the best storytelling happens is at, at that moment level. Mm -hmm. You can't stay there all the time, by the way. You sort of go, have to go from moment to those broader elements, but you've got to have moments in your story. Mm -hmm. I reckon if they did that, they would be... Uh, way ahead of many many people who uh, share stories actually and i'd throw in the other point is especially in business storytelling you got to know what your point of your story is and unfortunately a lot of people just throw you know just start to launch into a story they have no idea why they're telling that story right and as a result it it shoots off in all sorts of directions and it's got all these branches and you know people are trying to keep it in their head what's going on here and for a business person they won't, uh, they won't let you do that. Yeah. So you've got to be really, really specific about what the point is and, uh, and nail that point. Be focused. That's good. Yeah. Awesome. I, I, uh, I could learn from you all day uh, and I probably should um, <laughs> to tell better stories uh, and so should our listeners. Uh, but I want to get to, to my, my big one for you before I let you go. Um, Sean, if somebody told you today that you could tell no more stories and that tomorrow you're done, you got to find something different to do, what would your last story look like for you? What would you want to go out on? Oh, gee, what would I want to go out on? You know, I mean, there's, there's the, 
for stories to be interesting, they sort of have to touch on those big themes of life, right? And uh, you know, the, the stories that I would I would I would go out on it would be you know the stories of probably the stories of my family. I mean, they're, they're one of the things that you know mean the most to me, and uh, you know, to be able to share a you know a story. There's so many, but I mean, the one we touched on at the very beginning, you know, of my father being a U.S. Marine and and uh, and his his, you know, I'm, this is apropos of nothing really, but except for the fact that, you know, he had this opportunity when after the Kennedy assassination happened, uh, him and three other uh, riflemen, my dad was a, a sharpshooter. He was, uh, before he even joined the Marines, he was the, the top shooter in New Jersey. So, you know, like he was you know, very good at what he did. He said it was one of the worst decisions he ever made was to tell the Marines he was a sharpshooter because he ended up with really shitty jobs, I think, uh, shooting people from a distance, I suppose. But uh, yeah. um, but the after that happened, they actually erected a, a big tower, the same height as the, the book depository, and uh, they had a moving vehicle and they were all given uh, the rifle that was used, the Italian rifle that was used by... Uh, you know, in the shooting and, you know, it was a bolt action rifle. And he said that, you know, dad was a, a, a good shot, but they had an Olympic level shot you know, guy there and they all had a go at it and none of them came anywhere near uh, hitting the target, right? For the distance and the, and, the, and the equipment they were using. And so they wrote up their report and they handed it into the Warren Commission sort of, you know, with the idea that it'll all be worked out and, They'll sort of, um, uh, you know, come to the right conclusion. And, of course, when they got the result, they went, what happened there? You know, so anyway, the best laid plans of mice and men, right? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, so sharing sharing your dad's legacy would be a, a good way to go out, I think. That's, I think that's so. Good. I think Absolutely. so. There's plenty of those stories. Yeah, that's good stuff, Sean. Well, thanks for your time today, man. What's, uh, what's the best way for people to get a hold of you and Anecdote? Uh, just go to our website, anecdote.com. Uh, you'll find all the information there. Lots and lots of things we share there too. So, you know, we've been blogging since 2004. So lots of material uh, to d delve into. Yeah. And that's the nice thing I noticed is that, and that's what I love about companies like yours and, and guys like you, Sean, is we're, we're not holding the secrets behind a bunch of walls and stuff. We're going to teach because it makes the world a better place. As, as yeah. leftist as that may sound, <laughs> storytelling <laughs> really does make the better make the world a better place so yeah that's right cool man well I, I appreciate your time my friend no it's good it's been great chatting to you and uh yeah look forward to, to chatting again at some stage i very much appreciate my guest sean callahan coming on the show you can find all of the links uh to sean and anecdote in the show notes be sure to visit those and uh and check them out i got some great programs and the book is amazing uh so there you go if you enjoyed the episode please share it all around twitter linkedin facebook uh, anywhere you can put it, stumble upon, remember that one, uh, Reddit, put it somewhere for us to reach other storytellers. I appreciate very much. And uh, appreciate, I appreciate it. I don't know. I can talk, I swear. Uh, hey, until, uh, until next time, here's to telling our stories and having stories to tell. Cheers.